Let's begin. In Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Father God, we just thank you. We ask you to just be with us. As you guide us. And as you open our eyes and our hearts to your word. Be with us. Speak. We're listening. And you know, I said, you just take a moment and pray for yourself. You know what you need. You know what you're looking for. So in your own heart, in your own words, silence yourself. Just lift up your own prayers to God. And if you will, I'll say a prayer for me so I can be useful as a teacher. So Father God, we love you. And we give you this time. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Yeah, I want to apologize in advance. I'm going to trip over this cord about a thousand and a half times during this session, but I'll try and stand still. I just can't be behind the podium. It's too teacher-esque, and we've been together for about 24 hours. If I'm anything like a teacher or a professor or a doctor, it'd be like Dr. Seuss, right? So I just can't, I can't stay behind this. I feel too official. I feel much better just being out with you. And because we're talking about scripture, I thought that would make the most sense to just dive right in with the scripture reading, right? This is going to be a talk. I'm going to tell stories, and typically, if I'm being honest, I'll tell a story, and I go, technology, and you guys laugh, and, and hopefully that would be engaging and you lean in so that you want to hear what I want to say next. But the hope of this whole session is not so much that you want to hear what I want to say, but what God is saying through this word. And so the first story that we're going to hear is going to be from the Bible. So if you have a Bible, we're going to go to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. If you have a phone, you can Google it really quick if we get service in here. And if you don't have a phone with service, you don't have a Bible, that's fine too. I'm going to read it. Or just grab the Bible from the person next to you. Either way. <laughs> so Mark chapter 4, Somewhere after Genesis, if you hit Revelation, you went too far. <laughs> it's a Bible joke. It's a Bible joke. I love that y'all laugh at that. But we're starting verse 3. So Jesus says to the crowd, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky grounds, where it had not much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and yielded no grain. And the other seed fell into good soil, and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, and sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. What a crazy story. Right? I mean, like, we've heard this before, but, like, what, what a crazy story. I mean, this is Jesus teaching. Now, I don't come down on Jesus very often, but all that I'm saying is that if Jesus was here and he kind of gave that talk, me and my role as the MC, like, I would be... A little upset. I would, like if Pete or Sarah did this, like they just came up and they said, "Okay, there's a farmer." It's so kind of lackadaisical. He's just throwing seed. Some seed fell on the sidewalk. Some came out, and scorched it. Others, birds came, took it. Others, storms kind of came up, choked it. Some actually grew. If you have ears. <laughs> that's it that's the whole story and it's like where's the context Jesus like what do you what do you, what what is this about and that's exactly the reaction that the people and the apostles heard when they talked to Jesus later like what what, what was that I mean I know you're the Messiah you're doing a great job with that but can you please just back up a little bit and tell me what you're talking about with that farmer who was throwing seed everywhere and do you remember what Jesus said? He said the seed is the word. And he went on to explain. He said, sometimes you throw out the word and it lands on that rocky ground and there's just nothing there. 
And he's like, and for those people like that, just they're not in line with God. The devil's just going to take it right away. He said, some people, it starts to grow, but then the birds come. Right? Like things are going well, but then things get difficult, and it just snatches it up. And so as soon as the suffering comes, so does the faith. The one that always gets me is the thorns. Remember the thorns? He goes, the thorns, in one translation says, that's the love of lesser things. Where the stress of the world and the desires of the things of the world just start to take hold, and you love God and you love the world, but pretty soon it just starts to become too much. Now what was supposed to bear fruit now is being suffocated because there's so many other things in its place. But, but, he says that some seed does fall on good soil. People who receive the word, and they take in the word, and it bears fruit 30 times, 60 times, 100 times over. And y'all, as I was praying for this session, I just decided I was going to be that far. I'm just going to throw out the word, and if you guys want to grab onto it, you can grab onto it. But what I don't want to do is overcomplicate this. This book is the inspired word of God. And as Catholics, I don't know if we totally appreciate that. It's not because we don't think that it's great. It's just because we never really learned what this is. And we come to weekends like this and we hear speakers talk about things from this book. And and we see Bibles kind of like held up in the bookstore, and it's great, and it looks good, but the question is, is how do we really implement this into our lives? Because, let me be honest, I love everything about the last 24 hours. Again, I don't want to overstate this, but woo, is it good to be back with people talking about Jesus and celebrating the gospel, describing to me the good news of what Jesus has done in our life? It is so good. And honestly, and I see you over here. I know who you are. I know who you are over here. But all of you, hearing you worship, seeing you dive in to this weekend, it is so inspiring. But I got to tell you that there is nothing, there is nothing like diving into this book. For me, in my spiritual life, the times that I get to sneak away in this book and I just get to sit with God and let his words speak into my life, those are the moments that have been most transformative for me. Amen. And again, I'm not trying to take anything away from what we're doing here. Obviously, I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe in a weekend like this. But I want us to be able to take what God has given us here and take it back to our homes out there. Because the reality is, is tomorrow, in about 24 hours... We'll be heading home. And the band probably won't be with you. That'd be weird. (laughs) The speakers probably won't be following you. If we are, that's probably stalking, and you should tell somebody. (laughs) Yet, the inspired word of God is going nowhere. And so if we can stay close to this book, and if we can dive into this book, Everything that we talk about this weekend, the Holy Spirit, the power, everything can be held together here. And this is what I want for us. Now, earlier, I had you talk to someone next to you about why you're here. And again, I don't know what you said. Maybe the conversation just kind of digressed quickly and you started just talking about the weather outside. That's fine. But if I had to guess, the majority of us in this room are here for a couple various reasons. One, we just love this book. You know more about this book than most, and you just love it, but you just can't get enough of it, so we're talking about the Bible, and you want to be here. And that's fantastic, I'm glad that you're here. I'm probably not going to teach you anything new, but the beautiful thing is that this book just goes deeper and deeper and deeper, and so we can't dive into it enough. And so if that's you, awesome. Other people, you're here because, well, this book is pretty perplexing. Like, why do we need to know the genealogy of all these baby mamas before we get to Jesus? Like, what does that mean? Why do we, what, is that, what does that mean? Or what, what do we have to do according to the Song of Songs? What does that have to do 
just love poetry. It makes me feel a little weird when I read it sometimes. <laughs> what does Genesis have to do with Revelation? <clears throat> it's perplexing. What does something that was written 2,000 years ago or longer have to do with me today? And others, we might be here because, well, we just don't even know what to think of this book. It's archaic. It's ancient. But we know there's something here, and so we need to kind of figure it out. And my hope, again, is that we can just dive into this to really come to know who this is so that as our hearts are opened to God, his word and his seed may be planted so that it grows and bears fruit in our lives. Because I tell you that if we can read this book, if we can understand what we have here, lives will be transformed. It's just that simple. This is a powerful book. There are tons of great books in the bookstore. I went and cruised through there. There are so many I just wanted to pick up myself. But none of them, the best sellers, are not going to top this book. And so the question is, well, what do we do and how do we dive into this? What does this look like and what does this mean for us as Christians? Because I think sometimes we can get excited about this, but we don't know how to really dive into it. Or we dive into it, but we don't really know how to apply it to our lives. But the reality is, is that this book was written for each and every single one of us. So wherever you are, whatever you're struggling with, this book is for you. So if you have questions about relationships, this book speaks into it. If you're dealing with a whole bunch of stress and anxiety, this book speaks into it. You want to know about discernment? You want to know about how to deal with power, sex, you don't know how much to do with money. This book talks about it all. It was almost like God wanted us to read it. Because he knew what we were going to go through. And so the question is, is well, what do we do and how do we do it? And why should we do it? And the why is fairly simple. Because this is the inspired word of God. Written by the very breath of the Holy Spirit. Yes, John, Luke, all of the writers, they used their faculties. They were a part of it, but it was the breath of the Holy Spirit that inspired them. Right? So this isn't just words on a page. This is breath on a page. This is living and active. That there is a power, that there is a grace, that there is something here that reveals to us more of not just who Jesus is, but who we are. That's right. This is the only book that you can read. And if you get into it the right way, it's going to read you. It's going to tell you who you are. And there might be parts of this where you feel like, I don't know what this means, or ooh, I don't like that. But every single word was here, and it's good for teaching. And how do I know this? Well, because the book itself says this. The book itself speaks to its own power, which usually you would say that's kind of pretentious. Right? Like if you got a book and you're just like, what does this book say? Oh, this book says that this book is awesome. <laughs> like, you may not want to read that book. And yet, as you go through the Old and the New Testament, you see time and time again people reacting to this book or the author speaking directly to the inspired Word of God. In 2 Kings, there's a story where King Uzziah, he's a young king. It's spring cleaning. Maybe it's similar to the weather outside today, and they just go to the temple and start cleaning. And in this kingdom... They had forgotten about the Bible. I don't know if it's that hard for us to imagine about a culture that could forget about the Bible, but their culture did. And they find it, and they're like, what is this? And they literally dust it off. And they start reading it. And as they read it, they're just captivated, and they realize what they found. And as they read it and proclaim it to all the kingdom, they start just tearing their garments. You might think, like, that's weird. Just ripping their shirts. But it's cutting their hearts. And since they're having an internal, they're having an external reaction as well. They are so moved. And it's not the only time you see that in the Old Testament. In the book of Nehemiah, after he builds this wall, the prophet Ezra comes up. And they're going to read the word of God. And Ezra, he stands in front of everybody. And it says that he opens the book. He opens the scroll. And people just go, ah. <laughs> They just start cheering. Can you imagine? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Please don't do this. But if tonight... If tonight I started teaching, and I just went like this, because that's what happened when Ezra did. 
But the thing is, is again, if you go into this book to read it, it will read you. It turns from cheers to weeping because they're so convicted of what God's saying to them. But they are moved by the power of this book. And of course, we look at Jesus. What does Jesus say when he's in the desert? It's not by bread alone do you live, but by the very words of God. We can go further. Acts 10. The Gentiles are just hanging out. Paul starts just reading the word, and the Holy Spirit falls upon them. Hebrews says that this is too much sword. It's sharp, it's living, it's active. It can cut through bone and marrow, spirit and soul. Second Timothy says that this whole thing is good for teaching. This whole thing is good for teaching. Second Peter says it's like a lamp in the dark, inspired by the Holy Spirit, it'd be good not to ignore. Time and time and time again. We come into this book, and you can see that this book is affirming itself. Why? Not because God is pretentious, but because he knows that we need instruction on how to best live this life. When life gets troublesome, when life gets hard, we can turn to this book to find the words of God. Far too often, I talk to people, and they say, I pray, and I pray, and I pray, and I pray. And I just want God to speak. And I get nothing. And I understand that. I understand that. Pete Brack, who spoke last night, he's a good friend. You talk to him like all the time, and, and God's just always speaking to him. He'll be like, oh, I was at Costco the other day, and I felt like God be like, uh, you know, you gotta go the other lane, and, and he like has this amazing moment with someone. And I'm just like, I, I want to go to Costco with God. Like, how, how do you do that? You know? And and God just doesn't speak to me that way all the time. Sometimes, sure, but not all the time. But my question is, is is why are we trying to hear the Word of God if we're not even trying to read the Word of God? If we can't hear it, that's okay sometimes, but we can confidently go to this book and read it. Do you know how many songs I can sing from memory? Do you know how many movies I can quote? They get stuck in my head so simply. But these are living words from God to affirm on my relationship with Him and His love for me. Shouldn't these be a song that resonates in my heart day in and day out, and in your heart day in and day out. This is what we have here. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And don't get me wrong. I want us to be able to quote Scripture. Absolutely. But maybe, just maybe, you can imagine someone or picture someone who can quote Scripture, but they're still kind of a jerk. <laughs> So the goal itself is not just to be able to understand what this book is or be able to quote a few popular passages, but to let this book truly have a moment with your life. And for your life to have a moment with this book, to chew on it, to devour it, to let it become a piece of who you are. You know, what's crazy is that's actually an image that we see often in Scripture. Ezekiel and Jeremiah says they both got the words of God, they eat it. See in the book of Revelation 2. One translation says they devoured it. I love that. It's like, you know, they just go for it. And you can see my Bible, right? It's been through a lot. There's this old saying that you can tell if someone's life is stable, if their Bible's falling apart. Like if their Bible's falling apart, their life's not falling apart. I feel like I put that to the test. But... But it's been through a lot, and I've had this book for years and years and years, and this is my Bible. I have other Bibles, I have study Bibles, things like that, but this is my Bible. When I pray, this goes with me everywhere, this is what I want to go to, this is kind of my safety blanket when it comes to all things in the spiritual world. I love this book. But it's getting kind of shut. At least on the exterior. But for me, every line and mark is a story between me and the Word. But my favorite is this one right here, and I know if you're in the back you can't really see it, but I can describe it because it kind of looks like a tooth mark. And that's because it is. Because a handful of years ago, I was sitting at my house, and again, I have a handful of little kids, and they're always doing something they're not supposed to do. And I got distracted for a moment, my Bible was on the coffee table, and I don't know what I was doing or what was so important, but I took my eyes off my daughter for a second, who was just starting to teeth. And I turned around, 
And she's gnawing on my Bible. And I was like, that's what Jeremiah was talking about. <laughs> like, that's what it's supposed to look like. That's what it is. To just take it in and consume it. Now, I don't want you to actually go home and start eating a Bible like my daughter was as a two-year-old. But when I went to school here, I saw what it actually looked like through one of my roommates. Because there was a time when I was trying to get really committed into this book. I was really trying to understand what was so special about this. I was a catechetics major. I was a theology major. That's like, all oh, thanks God. Right? So I wanted to kind of get to understand why this book was so important, so primary in so many people's lives. And so my roommate and I decided that we were going to do a Bible study. That we were going to start to read through the book of Colossians. Now, if you've never read Colossians, it's five chapters, and Paul is not messing around. There's a lot going on in those two chapters. And so we just said that we were going to talk in a week or two, and we are just going to see what God was doing as we read through this book. We didn't really put a lot of parameters. We didn't really have a game plan. We were just going to read and then talk. And that was it. And so I went to the chapel that day, and during my prayer time, I put out Colossians, and I read all Colossians. I thought, that's great. And that was it. I was like, okay, I did my homework. Now I'll talk to my friend Joe in a week or two. And so we finally kind of came back to the conversation, and Joe was like, Chris, like, what do you think about Colossians? I was like, oh, man, like, oh, I love when Paul says this. And Colossians 2, when he like, gets into like, who Jesus is and like, all of his like, majesty, I'm like, oh, that's amazing. And then chapter 3 and 4, like, where he really, really, ah, and really gets into like, all of the important stuff of like, how we behave and what that means and what that looks like, like, that just was, whoo, I need to get some things straight up. You know, and I'm just, I'm going back and forth and trying to just remember everything that I read. And I finally just realized I'm talking a lot. And so I say, like, Joe, like, what was, like, what stood up for you? And he said, man, he's like, I haven't got past the first paragraph yet. <laughs> and I was like, you forgot to do the homework? And he's like, no. He's like, no. He's like, every time I get to this verse, I just become arrested. And he just stayed there in that moment. And he wasn't going to move past it until he felt like he really digested it. Could we chew on this book like that? Could we be willing to just step into a relationship with Christ in such a way that when we come to his word, that we're not just looking for a word, or we're not just looking for a phrase that's going to get us through the day, but that we're going to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit that is so powerful and so real that it just stops us in our tracks. I think that's what's possible here in this book. Now, I remember when I realized the power of this book for the first time. And I'll tell this story, and now we get to the practicals, because I want this to not just be about stories or feelings. I want this to be about how to practically take this book home. But for me, I need you to know about the moment that I realized what we had here in this book. Again, I was a college student, and I was living out in Arizona for the summer doing an internship. And I was living with this youth minister, and he was a great youth minister and had some invitations to go and give some presentations. And when you're an intern, you just kind of go with the guy you're interning for, right? So I was just kind of his shadow all summer and not really doing much besides following him around. And we went to this conference, and it was for young adults. And it was a weird thing because I had given talks before, and I had been a part of some teams with a lot of these presenters. So I kind of knew everybody, but I didn't really have a role. Again, I was just there. And so I would be a part of some meetings, but I wouldn't be a part of other meetings. They would kind of send me out to help with a workshop, but then they wouldn't really have anything for me to do later. So I just kind of ended up like cleaning. Like it was weird, but the best part was is that when the sessions came around, I just got to sit. Now I didn't have to worry about logistics or worry about saying anything. I just got to sit down and enjoy the conference. And it was a good conference. But what was interesting was that the idea of God's word was kind of interwoven through all the talks. It just started to happen. There wasn't anything that was planned. The conference wasn't like the Bible conference. It was just a conference about Jesus and the gospel. But everyone just started kind of talking about the power of the word. And the reason I remember that is because the last night that we were all going to be together, it was Pentecost Sunday. And again, I'm sitting in the green room with no real responsibility, and I remember the team comes around, and we're sitting at this table, and the leader says, so what do y'all want to do tonight? And 
I was like, wait, you guys don't have a plan? And they just start talking about it. And honestly, for the conversation that I heard, because I left pretty quickly because I thought that it was pretty awkward in that room, they didn't know what they were going to do. They're like, we'll just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to show up and we'll see what happens. And and I'm just like, okay, you cool cats have fun. I'm getting out of here because if this thing blows up in your face, like I don't want to know what's coming. I'm just going to go be a part of this night. And so I leave the green room. I go stay in prayer for that God's going to do something. And I just go and sit down with the rest of the congregation. And we just move into the night. And we hear a great talk, and it's a great talk. And then we move into some time of prayer because it's Pentecost. The day that we celebrate the Holy Spirit coming down into the church, we start praying with one another, and it's super powerful. But there's also part of me that just feels like there's something more. Like, this is Pentecost. Like, there's something more. Like, I've been in the back. I know behind the scenes there's a tabernacle. Like, let's bring out Jesus. Like, come on, let's do something. Let's do something crazy now. It's time for the Holy Spirit to show up. And so all of a sudden, as I'm thinking this, they actually start to set up an altar. I'm like, okay, me and God are on the same page. And they're setting up this altar, and the music minister starts to change keys and... I can tell that he's just starting to make up a song on the spot. And what he starts to do is he starts to sing John 1-1. One, one. And if you remember the way the Gospel of John starts, he actually sings a little different. I'm going to say what he sings, but it's just an inverse of the scripture. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He just starts singing that over and over again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And he's singing it over and over and over again. And then all of a sudden, in the back of the auditorium, the doors open, and in comes our priest. But he's not carrying the monstrums, that gold shiny thing that we put the Eucharist in. He's holding the book of the Gospels. And he comes walking down the aisle with the book of the Gospels held high. And y'all, it was like we were in the book of Nehemiah. (sighs) It was like electric in that room. And as the priest came forward, he was a Byzantine priest. And if you've never seen it, isn't uh, a Byzantine or Eastern Rite priest? They're just like our priests, but they wear some bling. Yeah. <laughs> they have hats. They have some more medals. They're amazing. And the way that they approach the liturgy and the Word of God is inspired. And so he comes forward, all decked out in his priestly garb, and he stands in front of everybody as the music minister is still singing John one one. And the priest opens up the word of God and sings as he proclaims the first chapter of John. And I thought, oh, this is amazing. But then the priest takes the book and he starts to come back down towards us. And he comes to every single person in the congregation to bring us the word. So we can have a moment where we venerated the word of God. And it was almost prophetic, as they would say something to you. This word is for you. God wrote this for you. Here's his love letter. To every single person, 500 people in the room, a moment just to be with the word of God. And then they come back, and they put the word on the altar. And in that moment, the music minister switches gears, and he starts singing John 1.14. And the word became flesh in Baltimore. And the doors in the back of the room open again. And in comes the monstrance. Jesus Christ, the body, blood, soul, and divinity. And Jesus comes in. And again. <laughs> and we're singing. And just like before, after a moment of veneration, Jesus comes down to every single person. We have a chance to venerate. And they come back and they put the monstrance next to the book of the Gospels. And we have the word in the Word. The Catechism teaches that we can actually venerate the Word of God in the same way that we venerate the body of Christ. I understand what that means now. And that night we worshiped for four hours. And I gotta tell you, it did not feel long enough. And I remember driving back to the cabin that I was staying with, with some of the other speakers. And all we could say is, what just happened? <laughs> What? Like, I would never plan that, right? I mean, if there's any youth ministers here or people who work with the church, it'd be really difficult to say, like, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray for people. 
We're going to pray with people. Then we're going to bring in the Bible. And people are going to go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to bring in Jesus. And we're going to do the whole thing again. And the whole thing should wrap up somewhere under five hours. <laughs> and that would never work. And yet, for some reason, that night, God did something amazing. And I should have gone to bed, but that night I went home. And I don't read scriptures. Because I just couldn't get enough. And I'm not saying I'm perfect, and I'm not saying I understand everything about this book, and I'm not saying that I pray it perfectly at all. At all. But I will say, since that night, there's probably only a handful of days that have gone by that I haven't dove into this book. Because once you see the power... It's hard to ignore. And so the question that obviously becomes, well, then how do we dive into this? Like, what do we practically do? Because I've tried to read this, and it doesn't make sense to me. Right? Like, maybe you've opened this book. Genesis, that's great. Right? Stories from our childhood. I mean, they're not really child stories. Like, you ever thought about that? The other day I was telling my daughter about Noah. I was like, oh, it's great. You know, like, there's... Like this ark, and you'll see like a giraffe with his head coming out, and he's smiling. And then I'm like, oh, but everyone else on the planet died. You know, like it's, it's pretty morbid. But all of these stories that we know and remember, Father Abraham, Adam and Eve, they're all there. And we're thinking like, yeah, this is pretty good. This makes sense. And we'll get to Exodus. That's fantastic. I've seen Disney movies about that. Right? We've seen Moses take the Israelites. But then we're going to get to Deuteronomy. <laughs> and you might power through. Well, Leviticus will get you. <laughs> and don't get me wrong. We can talk about why those books are there. But this book is actually a collection of books. It was never meant to be read cover to cover like some other book. This was really meant to be a library, a collection of letters, love letters for you so that we can come to encounter God in a way that speaks to us right where we are. And that's what's so beautiful about this book. And so you might be thinking, well, what does that really mean then? Practically speaking, how do I read this book? Where do I start? Well, the church in her wisdom says start with the Gospels. Because the Gospels are all about Jesus. And so if you've never read the Gospels, and if you've never opened the Bible, this is probably the place to start. <clears throat> And again, I don't want to overstate this, and I don't want to offend anybody because sometimes I've said this and people are like, I'm wearing this bracelet. I don't know if anyone's wearing a WWJD bracelet. Do you remember those? Those are fantastic. Anyone wearing one? Okay, great. So <laughs> here's the thing. They're great to be able to ask WWJD, what would Jesus do? They're fantastic. My mom and my grandma both got me one every year for about 12 years. <laughs> I had a plethora of them. They're fantastic. But here's the thing. With the Gospels, you don't have to ask, what would Jesus do? You can actually see what he did. And so we could be asking, like, what did Jesus do when he was tempted? We can see it. What did Jesus do when he's betrayed? We can see it. What did Jesus do when he was angry? He got angry. He made a weapon. I'm not saying we should make a weapon. But we can see what he does with righteous anger. He came to not just save us, but to be our perfect example. And so we start with the Gospels. And we can talk more about that in a second. If you're like, you know what? I've read the Gospels. love the Gospels. Big fan of Jesus. But I'm really looking to go a little deeper into this book. Like, what's the next step? Again, there are plenty of ways to do this. But for me, I'm a big fan of the songs. Because the songs are just music. And music moves the soul. Every human emotion is found in that 150 songs that we have here in this text. Most of them are from David. But it's amazing because David doesn't hold back. I think sometimes, at least I approach this book... And I think it's just going to be like, oh, God loved me, and I loved him, and everything was beautiful, and now I will just go have cookies baked with sunshine and go ride around in my unicorn because life is perfect. And that's not what this book is about. In some texts, yes, they would be like, God is all, um, all powerful and all good and all wonderful and everything great. And then the very next song, he'd be like, my life is horrible, I hate everything. And you're like, David needs hug and a counselor. Right? Like, David, and what's he doing? Why is he doing that? Why does it seem like such a roller coaster? Because life is a roller coaster. And David just bears it all. 
The psalmist just tell you what it is. And we can enter into that. Because again, we experience the same emotions. That these books were written by people for people. And we can enter into that. And like I said, there are 150 psalms. So I don't know if this is part of your daily prayer regimen. But if you just commit to reading one psalm a day, you're going to read this book for about half a year. That's not a bad way to start. And if you're thinking like, well, I don't, I don't know, like the psalms sound good, but like what about some of the other confusing texts? Or what about the Old Testament? What about the New Testament? The New Testament is filled with letters. The early church leaders writing to young church members who are trying to figure out how to live this faith. The Old Testament, there's a lot of history. And there's a lot of imagery. But with a little study, we can come to understand what to do with this and how to best enter into it. And this is where we take a step further in our learning, because I think sometimes we come to this book and we think it's like a magic eight ball. Right? Like, I'm going to pray with this, and I'm just going to ask God to give me something, and... <laughs> Try again. <laughs> when I was a student here, I had a teacher who would call that scripture roulette. And she was adamantly against it. Because even though the odds are likely... You could open up the scriptures and find a verse that says, Go and do likewise, which are words that are found in the Gospels. And you could then close your Bible open again and see words that say Judas hung himself. Am I supposed to do that likewise? I don't think so. And this is where we get into, as adults, a better way to understand this book. Because we don't want to just pull ice in Jesus, which means, what do I think this means? We want to know what is actually happening here. We want to exegete. We want to understand this book in a way that makes sense. And the church has given us the four senses. Really, there's two, but one is kind of broken down into three subcategories. The four senses of Scripture to help us better navigate this book. The first and the most important is the literal. We need to literally understand what was being said. That this book wasn't just created in a vacuum. That Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, David and the Psalms, Moses and the early books of the Bible, they were writing with a very specific purpose. So what was the literal meaning? And don't get me wrong, that does not mean that everything is literal as in factual or historical. Genesis 1. The creation story. It doesn't mention anything about dinosaurs. Maybe pick up on that at some point. And science tells us that the world was formed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years before humans showed up. So what, what do we do here? It's a problem. But we need to look at the literal sense that maybe Moses isn't telling us exactly how God did what he did, but the truth that God did do what he did, that God did create, that he is a creator, that we are his creation. I mean, how do we know that there's maybe some truth that goes deeper than just literal history in Genesis 1? Well, go to Genesis 2, because it's another creation story, and it's different from the first. So how do we justify that? We need to understand what Moses is trying to do. Is he trying to give us history, or is he trying to give us something deep? Same with the parables. Jesus says at one point, if your hand causes you to sin, go cut it off. If it's your eye, scoop it out. Does Jesus literally want us to just start cutting ourselves up? I don't think so. So what was the literal meaning? What was happening there that we're supposed to take away? And this takes a little bit of study. But maybe not as much as you think. Most Bibles... Or apps, if you use your phone or iPad or whatever it might be to read the Bible, will often have some kind of description of the book that you're about to dive into. Sometimes it's a paragraph, sometimes it's a couple pages. If you get a study Bible, it can almost be like an entire chapter. To just give you enough context to help you understand what is going on. I mean, that shapes our Gospels. There's a reason we have four Gospels. Mark. He's writing to the very early church, to the non-believers, to the Romans. 
And because he's trying to get to an audience who's never heard this message before, he's going quick. It's an action flick. It's the sports center of the Gospels. <laughs> I open up Mark and I just hear, do 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 <laughs> Because he just wants, the guy's got that, the winner right now. But it's because he just wants people to know who Jesus is and the power that's found in So he's moving. You don't see Jesus until he's doing his active ministry. Luke, it's kind of a sci fi kind of book. Because he was a doctor. And he wanted to really highlight the majesty and the miracles of Christ. Matthew, documentary slash home video, because he's writing to the Jewish people. And he wants to be able to connect the Old Testament and the heritage of the Jewish people to what Jesus has done. And John, sorry, man, John's a rom com. <laughs> He's diving straight at the heart of Jesus. The Gospel of John talks about love more than the other three combined. But there's a purpose there. There's a literal intent that when Mark sat down however many years ago, he knew his audience and he was writing and trying to convey a specific message. So we start with that. And then from there we move into the spiritual. And the spiritual sense is divided into three categories. Big words, allegorical, moral, and anagogical. I'll explain those in a second. So allegorical is how does all of this relate to Jesus? Revelation tells us that God has spoken a single word, and that word is Jesus. So how does God's word point back to Jesus? An example would be in the Old Testament, when we read about the Israelites going through the Red Sea. We can look at that and say, well, that's kind of like Jesus and the grace that he gives us in baptism. Or we have a past and we have our sin and we have our chains behind us, but we go through the waters and we come out on the other side free. So we ask as we read, what does this look like in my relationship with Jesus? How does this draw me closer to Christ? Or sometimes we can go with the moral. And this is simple. This is what does this mean for me? How does this change the way I behave? When I read Corinthians, and Paul says that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, what does that mean about the way that I should treat other people or treat myself? And the anagogical. How does this point us to heaven? What does this mean for who I am in light of eternity? So just going back to that last example of Corinthians and our temple being a, or our body being a temple of the Holy Spirit. Literally, Paul is writing to the Corinthians. A hodgepodge crew. A huge city with a port. And there was a saying back in the day, to live as a Corinthian. Which basically meant you do whatever the heck you want. And there was a great booming church there, but there was a lot of debauchery as well. And people from all over the world would come to Corinth. And then you came into that port, you would see all kinds of temples to pagan gods. The most famous was the one of Aphrodite that sat up on the hill in the center of the city. Aphrodite was the goddess of love. And when you came to the city of Corinth, you'd be expected to go and make an offering which today we would say you'd be expected to sleep with one of the prostitutes who were there. So literally, Paul is writing to these people who would know that, and he would know that they see this temple, and Paul says, that's not a temple, you're a temple. Do you see how the scripture starts to come alive when you start to understand the context? What does this mean for me? How does this point to Jesus? Well, Jesus made me new. The Spirit dwells in me. I'm valuable. I'm important. Because of what I didn't know, but because of who decided to dwell and have a relationship with me. I am a temple. I shouldn't mess that up. That should change the way that I act as we move into the moral sense. I'm a married man. That means I should be faithful to her. And what does that mean going forward to heaven? Well, someday I'll be in God's Lord. And all that he has given me, I will give back to him, and I will rejoice in that reality for all eternity. 
This book is not boring. This book is powerful. This is why St. Jerome said, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. So if you want a deep relationship with Jesus, we need to have a deep commitment to this book. Amen? Amen. Now you might be thinking like, okay, so those are practical, but, but what does that mean? Because before you said you can get a scripture and be a jerk, and, and I stand by that. <laughs> and we don't have much time left. So let me just go through a couple quick things, and then we're going to try to quickly pray a little bit with this book. So first and foremost, this morning we did Ignatian prayer with Sarah. She asked you to engage her senses. St. Ignatius has a whole way of praying the scripture. It's called the spiritual exercises. And it's an incredible way of praying if you've never done it. You dive into the scripture using your imagination and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you. Some of you that might be a little bit outside your comfort zone, that's okay. Some people in here are maybe a little bit more analytical. They pray, but they also want to have a firm understanding of what's going on. That's great. That's important. If that's you... I love the SOAP method, S-O-A-P. You find a scripture, that's the S. You observe what's going on, that's the O. So what's happening here? What's Paul saying? What's Mark saying? What's Jesus doing? If that's difficult, just follow the verbs and move the story along. Who's saying what? The A is application. What does this really mean? How do I take this from the context of Scripture and put it into the context of my life? Where does this best fit? And what does this mean for me? And then P is pray. Bring all of that to God as you just dove into the Word of God. Yeah. This is very similar to the question. We're going to get to the question. So, yep. so scripture, observe, apply, pray. And I think somewhere in between the Ignatian and the Soul Method, as was just pointed out, there's Lexio Divina, one of the oldest ways of praying the scripture in the church. Where we dive into scripture, and we dive into scripture, and we dive into scripture. It's a sacred reading where we give the space to the Holy Spirit. And if you've never done this, it's very simple. All you do is you find a scripture and you read it once. Just to get familiar with it. Maybe something will pop. Maybe something will stick out. Maybe you'll get some kind of inclination in a moment of prayer. But you just sit there. And you sit there with that word. And after a moment or two of silence, and as you get more comfortable with this, that silence can expand and become longer and longer. But you dive back into the same text, and you read it again, this time a little slower. But this time you ask God, like, what do you want me to see here? What does this mean for me? What's the application? Where's the grace in this verse for me right now? And we sit, and we're silent. And then a third and final time, we dive back into the same text. And this time, we pray for the grace to see what God is doing and how this changes is going forward, because I believe that we don't come in contact with Jesus and leave the same person. And so what does this mean for us? How does this change us, and how does this affect the way I'm supposed to live today? It's not difficult. But it doesn't mean it's easy. But the more we do it, the simpler it becomes. And so what I want to do is actually try and do that with a few minutes that we have here. Now, if you're not used to praying the scripture, this might be difficult. But we're going to do it in just a few short minutes. So for some of you, you pray all the time. This is going to be nothing. For some of you, it's a little warm in here. And caffeine from lunch is started to run a little low. And it might be easy to let our minds drift. But like Paul says in 2 Corinthians, that we need to hold our minds captive. And so I want to pray that as we dive into this text that we should all be familiar with, because it's from today's gospel, 
May we just take a moment to be present to God in His Word. If you have your Bible, today's Gospel was from Mark 12. So back in the book of Mark we go. And I'm not going to read the entire Gospel. Sometimes when it comes to Scripture, less is more. Again, our hope here is not just to consume the Word like it's any other book, but to chew on it. To really take it in. And so, as I try and find it myself, what what was it? Forty-one. Why I'm hearing different things. Thirty-eight. Your gospel reading. Thirty. Got it. Got it. Thank you. And I'm gonna start at forty-one. Verse forty-one. Mark 12, 41. Thank you for being patient with me. So, let's just take a moment. Sometimes it's just too easy to jump in. And although that's beautiful, let's take a moment to pray that the Holy Spirit would just come and be with us. To begin the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, we know that you've given us this word. And we ask for eyes to just see your movement here in this text. Open our hearts to receive, so that we may be good soil. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. And Jesus sat down opposite the treasure, and watched the multitude putting money into the treasure. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make and he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, her whole living. And I'll just take a few seconds of silence. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury, and he watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums, and the poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, her whole living. Jesus sat down opposite the treasure and watched the multitude putting in money into the treasure. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, 
which make a pen. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, her whole living. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you be with us, that you guide us, and that you continue to open our hearts to you speaking to us in the word and in our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Y'all know that was brief. That's because we're running out of time. But there's usually one last step to Lexo Divino. Usually what we do at this point is we go journal. And we just kind of write it out. And it could be a conversation with God or just a reminder to ourselves of what just happened. And so, very briefly, minute tops, I want you to turn to someone and just share a little bit about what that moment was for you. Maybe you felt something, maybe something popped, maybe you saw something in scripture that spoke to you, maybe you didn't have much of anything, that's okay. This isn't magic, right? This is grace. That word is different. But to just share a little bit, to take it from what we just did internally and share it externally. And so let's go ahead and close in prayer, and then we'll send y'all on your way. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Father God, again, we just thank you. We just thank you for all that you're doing. God, we just again ask for an outpouring of your spirit and for an openness to all that you have in store for us. Open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to you, now and forever. All glory to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Am